Hello and welcome back to In the Envelope, an awards podcast. I am, as always, your host, Jack Smart, the awards editor at Backstage, your guide to the acting industry and the most trusted name in casting. We are here to give you a behind-the-scenes look at some of the buzziest contenders for the small screen's biggest trophy, the Emmy Award. This season of In the Envelope is brought to you by HBO. I love doing this. This feels very much like, um, you know, a home for me in this work. And I knew the first day of the first class that I took, I'm going to be doing this. I just knew. But the, the work for me was to discover how to do it. Welcome, listeners, to Westworld. <laughs> uh... Once a, every w- couple episodes, we got to take actors to the old west and the far future. Go to HBO's Westworld. It's our, one of our favorite shows, man, for a reason. Am I right? Yeah, there are no rules in this podcast. You can murder and <laughs> whatever you want to do. <laughs> you can be a robot. You can be a cowboy. Yeah. You can interview actors who are in this amazing show. Yep. Who are Emmy nominated. So we've spoken with Tandy Newton, and today. We have Jeffrey Wright, who plays Bernard yeah. on Westworld, um, for which he is nominated for his second Emmy Award. Uh, his first, it should be noted, was for supporting actor in a miniseries or movie for Angels in America, which he won. Yeah. So, who knows? Could history repeat itself? I mean, Westworld is... It's got to clean up at the... Uh, now we don't have Game I of Thrones in the, in the... Uh, in the running it could it was nominated for the most emmys this year tied with saturday night live yeah and his his part particularly in this show is is so crucial to the to the whole running of it and and he has yeah he has a quite the arc in this series and we allude to that in the uh in the interview yes we do yeah and in fact uh listeners who have not watched season one of westworld first of all go watch it immediately um but it's you know it's okay if you have not because we do venture into spoiler territory at one point, but I I believe we kind of indicate that. And in general, Jeffrey Wright is just a fountain of wisdom. He Mm -hmm. just knows his stuff. Obviously, he's acting royalty. He's Jeffrey Wright. Yeah, and and he sounds great. I mean, when I was listening (laughs) and I was like, man, this guy has got a voice and a half. Yeah. Yeah, this is good. We have some very um, honey-voiced actors on this podcast, which is always good. And you you can elaborate on this, but didn't he proposition you at the end of the <laughs> interview? Oh, yes, he did. Um, well, sort of. He said, and we were talking about surfing because I, I grew up surfing and it's something that Jeffrey Wright has discovered recently. Um, and he's in L.A. and he kind of tries to go to Malibu. He tries to, he tries to go surfing every day. But it's the kind of thing where I don't know how to, like, ask a celebrity to go surfing with them and you know, without coming off creepy or clingy. Um, so he like sort of met, he was like, oh, that's so cool that you do it. And then like, we almost talked about maybe going surfing together and then it didn't happen. And it'll probably end up being, you know, one of my greatest regrets probably ever. Well, I think a future episode of the podcast should be on the back of a surfboard. We'll rig up some kind of waterproof <laughs> recording system. That... Yeah. <laughs> oh God. I would love that so much. <laughs> Maybe if he wins an Emmy Award and we'll do an interview with just Emmy winners and ours will be an aquatic interview <laughs> yes. out in the Pacific. Oh, God, I would love that. Oh, my God. There's more Waterworld than Westworld. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. Apparently, if you surf, uh, it helps your acting. That's what he said, because it, it makes you more zen. It, it helps you clear your head. Yeah. You commune with nature. Yeah, that makes sense. Anyway, he talked about a lot of uh, things that will help you become a better actor and a, and a better, more well, well-rounded person, because um, that's who he is. He's really a pro. Um, I think working actors are going to get a lot out of this interview. Yep. Should we get to it? Yes. All right. Let's take a short break and then go to our interview with Jeffrey Wright. This episode is brought to you by HBO's original limited series, Big Little Lies. Told through the eyes of three mothers, Big Little Lies paints a picture of a town fueled by rumors, conflicts, secrets, and betrayals. Vanity Fair raves. The performances are downright mesmerizing. For your Emmy consideration, an outstanding limited series and all other categories. (laughs) 
Jeffrey Wright is a Tony and Emmy award-winning actor best known for playing Mr. Lies and Belize in Angels in America on stage and screen, as well as in several James Bond and Hunger Games films. He's currently starring as Bernard in HBO's Westworld, the sci-fi western thriller drama created by Jonathan Nolan and Lisa Joy. Here it is, our interview with Jeffrey Wright. The first audition that I did after college was an open call. Mm. Don't think it was listed in backstage. Mm. I was in DC, it was in the Washington Post. It was a cattle call that they would have annually. I don't know if they still do it, where they would invite all the directors and casting folks from the theater, the theaters in the area to Arena Stage, which was like mm-hmm. kind of the mothership totally. uh, uh, theater in D.C. and really one of the most significant, important, you know, regional theaters in the country. And so, we, you know, everything's like for a week, you know, you just kind of piled into Arena Stage and you had a couple monologues that you did. I was just out of college. You know, I'd graduated in in May, and I think this was maybe in June oh, wow. uh, of 87. And so I went in and did my couple of things. I think I did a James Baldwin piece, mm. and I forget what else, James Baldwin's birthday today, I think, actually. Mm-hmm. He was actually a teacher in Amherst when I was there, but um, sidetrack. Uh, yeah, so went in and, uh, and did my piece, and I got uh, cast uh, that, for, later that summer, beginning of the school year, doing children's theater. Touring, oh, cool. Touring around gotcha. metropolitan D.C. area, singing songs about John Henry and Davy Crockett and all this stuff, <laughs> and Sojourner Truth, and it was... Uh, Educational kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, you know, I did... Count. But, but, but subsequent to that, I mean, I like to say, really, that that was the beginning of every job, that I just that audition, cool. that open call that open audition. Day. Yeah. Because from that... Got that gig. There was also someone from the Folger Shakespeare Theater uh-huh. in D.C. who saw me. Michael Kahn gave me a huh. job as like the third stone from the left <laughs> yeah. in Classic. All's Well That Ends Well uh-huh. at the Folger. Those were my first two gigs that were kind of gotcha. overlapping. I was doing children's theater in the morning. Uh, I was waiting tables at night for a while, uh-huh. um, going to the racetrack in between with all this cash. And I had, so I'd go up to Pimlico. Or Laurel Race Trap Pimlico's up in Baltimore, and I'd go bet on the horses and kind of would you really and kind of like you know study all these crazy <laughs> characters. I was just a great like kind of a good uh, watching. laboratory or petri dish for Whoa. a character there. Anyway, but then uh, Michael Kahn gave me this job all at the Folger one... from that one audition. Now from that, I auditioned for a part at. Uh, arena stage in a play called Le Blanc, which was Lorraine Hansberry's last play yes. that she wrote as she was dying. Hal Scott, who was head of Rutgers Theater Department, uh, was directing the play. The role had been written for him. I went over to Arena Stage. I said, hey, I see you're doing this play. Here's my resume, my scanty, little skimpy little resume, and yeah. I want to audition for this. And they're like, who are you, guy? So uh, I did. They let me audition. Oh. They sent me up to New York. I auditioned again for how I got the job. I came back. But the reason I say all this wow. is because it was all related to this, you know, to to this first audition uh, at Arena Stage. The second one, I kind of, you know, stuck my foot in the door and jammed it, jammed right. my way in. But out of that, Zelda Fitchhandler invited me to go to NYU mm-hmm. to grad school, which I did. I only stayed for two months. You know, I'm a quick study. <laughs> uh, but I left I'll to do that, that play. Uh-huh. Uh, that we'd done at Arena, Le Blanc, up in Boston. The idea that it was coming back to New York. It didn't come back to New York, but I came back to New York in 89, January, I think, of, uh, of 1989. The guy who played, one of the guys who played my brother in the play had an agent and recommended me to his agent. Uh-huh. She, her name was Patty Wu. She, they said, well, I don't know, Tony, you say he's, you say he's good. Well, we'll, you know, we'll send him out. Sent me out on a job, on an audition for a play up at Yale Repertory Theater. Uh-huh. It was my first audition in New York when I came back, and I got the job. So from huh. that, I would get, I would be invited back up to Yale two years after three years going. They would give me a play. Lloyd Richards there would give me a play to mm. do. Zelda, even though I left school, would bring me yeah. back down to Arena Stage for three years in a row. I ended up doing the acting company 
with one of those directors, Joe Dowling, who gave me my first bit of Shakespeare to do. So I toured during Midsummer Night's Dream. But again, I say all this because it was all built out of those first auditions and one thing kind of led to another. So the role that backstage plays for an early, you know, for someone early in their career or, you know, particularly is, is, is career building potentially. And it's, it's good for kind of knowing what is being cast and what is going on. Absolutely. And the, Walking into the audition or walking into the room and handing your resume, your scant resume to someone. Yeah. You said that you shoved your foot in the door. Yeah. Is that, is that a thing? Like, is that really a thing that catapults actors? I mean, you hear the success stories of that sometimes, but how often does it happen that somebody does that and just make a fool of themselves? Well, yeah, you can do that too. <laughs> but, you know, that's kind of my, you know, golden rule of, you know, of, of performing, you know, that's kind of like the driver, you know, uh, behind you know pretty much everything I've done don't make a fool of yourself you know you get on really? stage yeah don't make a fool of yourself so <laughs> be prepared you know yeah but yeah I guess what I'd done I wrote if I recall is I'd read this upcoming season for the theaters yeah for the theater companies in DC and I saw that they were doing this play Le Blanc I read the play I said wow there's well, this role the here play. yeah there's this role because I hadn't read the play at that point yeah. I said there's, there's this role here that is like perfect for me oh, cool yeah and that's so and i didn't have an agent i didn't you know i didn't know you Certainly. know so i just and i if i anything... just went back over to the theater and i said hey um i hear you got this role yeah this is me and you're like yeah don't bother me kid <laughs> you know but, where the theater is you know what they're doing yeah and you know that there, there's a character that's a fit yeah so you just go for it yeah yeah i mean you know work for me <laughs> yeah and so what is what are your thoughts on the audition room like how how do actors at that early stage? It sounds like you, several of your big first auditions you nailed. Yeah, I guess I I did. You know, um, I guess the, an audition is an opportunity to to perform, mm-hmm. and so f- for me at that time, you know. I didn't necessarily have a lot of opportunities to work, and even though it was work without pay, I mean the pay off potentially was the job. Uh, yeah. So I back then I used to take those. I was you know I was hungry. You know I used to take those <laughs> things very seriously, hmm. and uh, I would pretty much you know for those first early I pretty much showed on showed up you know ready to you know to knock it in the mouth you know I was I yeah. was I was ready to go, um, so. Yeah, you know. Is that be, a different skill from... Be a Boy Scout. Not on... like a Trump Boy Scout, but be prepared, you know. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Um, what do you wish that you had known at that stage, at that early stage? Um, about? About, let's say, the craft. And then I'll oh. go to the career stuff, because that's... Yeah, I, you know... Um, I'm interested in this idea of not making a fool of yourself. Yeah, I didn't know anything. I so but for me like for anyone you know there was an individual kind of journey of discovery and so I don't wish I I knew everything I knew needed to know at that time which was essentially nothing you know cool um and wow. that was part of the reason that I left um uh, drama school hmm. was that I didn't feel that for me being in a classroom, even though it's an opportunity to perform, but I didn't feel that that was the setting gotcha. to really build on what I needed to build on. Plus, I had just graduated from college. You know, even though I I was a political science major in college, mm-hmm. I had nothing to do with the theater, even in high school. And I started acting my junior year of college because it had been kind of gnawing in the back of my head and it was something I was afraid to do. And finally, I did it, and I was like, "Wow, this this feels like it's something very afraid. new." Yeah. And um, so I didn't, I you know, I didn't know much. I didn't have a list of, you know, I, I wasn't by any means a dramaturg, you know, I, right. you know, I, I, I had very limited experience on stage or performing. And so for me, it was like, okay, I love doing this. This feels very much like, um, you know, a home for me in mm-hmm. this work. And I knew the first day of the first class that I took, I'm going to be doing this. I, you know, I just knew. So, but the, the work for me was to discover how to do it in the real world in the real world yeah. and how to um you know to 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 shape you know and build a craft and so huh. i you know i i from that point on 
you know, back in D.C. in 1987, I worked for seven years almost exclusively in the theater. I did a couple of film roles here and there. Okay. Um, and till I, you know, got the role of uh, Belize and Mr. Lies and Angels in America on Broadway. Yes. And it was only in the second half of that run, which was a year and a half on Broadway, mm -hmm. it was only then that I started to call myself an actor. Wow. Yeah. After winning a Tony Award. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't It wasn't really, it wasn't even winning the Tony Award, but it was some experiences that I had during the process of mm. doing that, um, that role of having, you know, worked for seven years to get there mm. and then doing the role. And then I had, you know, I went through a pretty tough time mm -hmm. and was able to kind of come through it and still do my work. And I said, you know what? Nobody can tell me that I'm not an actor right now, you know, from this day forward, you know. Yeah. yeah. And if you act through tough the tough times, that strengthens your identity as you cope with those tough times, right? Yeah, well, it also it well it gave me yes, and it gave, but it gave me a sense of um confidence uh mm. in 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 what it is that I did and mm -hmm. that I did it pretty well and that I had some control over it. I, what happened was a very close friend of mine passed away uh, in the middle of that run. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. He was actually, uh, he was my roommate and like a brother of mine. And I came home after a performance and I found him, I found him dead in our apartment. Wow. Yeah. And uh, that was uh, on a Friday, April 15th, 1994. His name was Ascanio Sharpay. And he was an actor as well, had gone to Juilliard and we'd met doing a play in uh, early in my time in New York became very close and uh, yeah it was a Friday and I took the weekend off from the show and dealt with all of the various things that you have to deal with in those times um, yeah making sure he was properly taken care of and 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 I had to come back on do my job on Tuesday yeah <clears throat> and uh, it was Millennium Approaches and the first scene that Belize has and that mm -hmm. is coming in to Pryor's hospital room yeah and trying to comfort his what he thinks is his dying friend and yeah and I uh, I almost I almost didn't make it through it but you know I can't imagine yeah but I did and uh, and at the end of that it was funny at the end of that night I, I was like at the I think it was at the end of that scene it was the it was one of the first times that I got uh, Bizarrely, got um, exit applause. And I was oh like, wow! And I was like, wow. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. and it's it almost part of the. Yeah, that's uh, why you're calling yourself an actor now, too. Well, no, it wasn't the. It wasn't the. It wasn't the approval of the audience at all. But I, because at the time, I I thought it was my friend leading, you know. Uh huh. Leading the applause, but it was just that. Uh, no, it was just getting through it. Yeah. In, that, in exactly yeah. surviving that. Yeah. And yeah. of course, you're going to come out of that and say. I'm an actor now. I'm a yeah, Broadway actor. Yeah. I did that on yeah. Broadway after that happened. Yeah, and uh, screw you if you try to tell me any different. Right. Yeah. yeah. Which, you know, is important, you know? And we mm. all have our own... We all have our own lives to live and our mm -hmm. own experiences to have that we, you know, try to bring uh, into the framework of our, of our uh, you know, of our... Of our, our, our characters and our stories, um, sure. but I think it's you know you've you've got to have this this sense of uh, you know reliance on your own self, uh, and yeah. you know and, and it's and, and and I see a lot of actors, uh, you see some and you and, and you know it's a journey again, but mm -hmm. you see and you see just that insecurity which can play in a certain way, but. But, it, you know, there's a journey toward gaining that sense of purpose, sense of place, and sense of, mm. of, of not certainty because, you know, I don't want to seem, but a sense of confidence yeah. and comfortability in one's own skin that allows you to explore other skins. Yeah. Well, and does a, does a plan B, like, fall into that kind of aiming for that confidence? Like, you studied politics. Yeah. Was there like a oh if this acting thing doesn't work out I will do X like did you want to do other things? Never even gave it a, a minute. From thought. that first moment. No, of acting, yeah, never. No, you know I, I came from kind of a 
Uh, you know, my mom was a lawyer and there was a household, household full of lawyers. And I grew up in D.C. I grew up with my mother and my aunt. My, mom, my aunt was like uh, chief surgical nurse at D.C. General Hospital. So she, she had a you know, medical profession, med- medical background. And so there was all this kind of professionally oriented women yeah. uh, that, I, that I was raised by. But, mm. And then, you know, the folks that would gather around them. So that, and it was D.C., which is a very kind of bureaucratic and kind of professionally mm. oriented. Or mm-hmm. prof- but so I kind of b- broke through, broke free from that, you know train of thought and um but once i'd started acting no there was never any thought given wow. to a plan b wow yeah. um in fact you know uh yeah, i was talking today about this because lisa joy in rehearsal was uh-huh. asking me about you know what did you ever have any you know starving artist days or you know you just i was like well, you know, what are you talking about i was like two three months back behind on a rent you know yeah when, on more than one occasion you did, when that. I, you did that when i was you know and um <clears throat> but even in those times i was kind of insistent that i didn't want to wait tables which is kind of um mm. a kind of not necessarily the most practical thing but i i said wow. for me and again this is not necessarily pragmatic i said you are what you do Mm -hmm. And I want to act and it would be in between gigs. So I'd have a gig, you know, at, you know, Yale rep and I'd come back home and then I'd just, you know, be out auditioning and doing the hustle and trying to get the next thing. And and I was just sure that the next thing was going to come. And I, you know, maybe Hmm. I was charming enough to say, "Ah, your your money's, your money's, you know, don't worry. Yeah. Just don't worry. My agent's <laughs> she's calling any minutes <laughs> with this reassurances that you'll be your rent will be paid. But there is um, a faith. There's a, you got to have faith. Yeah, in yourself you got to. You got to. You got in to. In the future, you have yeah. to. Yeah, I didn't have any kids. You know, it was just me. Right. I was young, twenty. And like something you said, hungry. New York, and you know, yeah, man. You want it badly enough. Out in the wilderness. Let's the wilderness. figure it out. Yes. Yes. And so the technical stuff you very much learned on the job. Yeah. Is that true for the? transition to screen acting was this a big old transition from one to the other or yeah um you know um it, it's you know it's ironic you know in the theater you're reaching you know 500 people a thousand people whoever's in the yeah. audience you know and through film or you know the camera i you know ideally you're reach, reaching more than 500 you know sometimes you're only yeah. reaching right. but you know sometimes if you're, you know, you're, you're yeah. yeah but if you're reaching you know Five million. The irony is that you have to give a much smaller performance, yes. you know, on camera than you do in the theater uh, to reach, you know, that, uh, you know, that audience. And, mm-hmm. and there's a, and there's in some ways kind of at least the like a simulation of an of, a, of an intimacy with the audience Ooh. through the camera because you're in their living rooms or you're in there in the screen and you're big. So yeah, you well, kind of distill it down. Are you, you think about it. their living rooms when you're on camera or no, no, okay. no, 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 no. But it's implied, you yeah, know, it's sure, implied, sure, sure. you know, because yeah. you're, you know, you're that camera's there. So yeah, that was for me, that was the great thing about doing, um, angels of America twice doing it on stage and then right. doing it during the film version. Cause I was like, wow, I kind of relished in the idea of being able to take that language and, and really refine it and play the intimate notes yeah. and play it in a totally different Different way that I was going to say. So, how different was it from one to the other? Yeah, it was. It was. I did not get to see you on stage. Oh yeah, you know? and I assume that, like you said, you're playing to five hundred thousand yeah. people. Yeah, and yeah. Belize in the film. Yeah, he basically whispers. Yeah, <laughs> really, really soft. <laughs> I rewatched that scene in the diner. Oh yeah, just last night. And yeah, it is just down low yeah it's very very soft it's very very quiet it makes us lean yeah in. it's amazing but it's all very you know very like kind of they're weapons though oh we're, for sure we're weapons yeah. yeah there's poison yeah. yeah yeah so it was uh it was very different it wasn't like back to the drawing board per se but no no and not at all it was just 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 kind of you know transcribing it to a film performance yeah for, film, film performance you know 10 years later and no because yeah. i had done it you know for forever i you know seven an hour play year and a half yeah. on broadway there were no choices that i was going to like kind of go back and reconsider really sure yeah. you know it was like because i pretty much tried them all it's like okay i had really, <laughs> i think a year and a half worth of I rehearsal know it works. is yeah. enough yeah. yeah and that's the great thing because i know you know what an audience you know i knew what the audience i knew what they responded to i uh-huh. you know because i'd been there and you know so it was just like yeah just like hmm. refining it and and distilling it and and bringing it down and yeah. Did you work fun. with Tony Kushner both times? Tony was on set, for, yeah, when we shot okay. the film, yeah. Because yeah. I feel like that's part of the revisiting a role. It's kind of nice to 
reconnect with the person who wrote the words the first time around. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, Tony and I have stayed in touch throughout, though. We've never really kind of broken. Yeah. It's, cool. You know, yeah. But, he, um, yeah. I mean, the first time, first time, you know, was a very different experience because I mean, you, uh, Tony, I, I mean, there's the heaven, there's a heaven speech mm-hmm. in the second part in Perestroika that he actually wrote. I, you know, he says with me in mind, it wasn't in the, it wasn't in the, right. in the, in the, in the play until we did on Broadway and he showed up one day and he said, I wrote, wrote something for you for this. And I was like, oh my God. Oh, it wasn't until Broadway. I see. Yeah. And uh-huh. I was like, oh my God, it was, most, it was incredible, Crazy. incredible gift that anybody ever given me. But that said, they all wanted to fire me. Wait, when? When I, when, uh, at the beginning of, of, of Angels. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, of the Broadway one? Yeah. Why? Yeah, because I was, not, you know, George, George Wolf, George, George <laughs> stuck by my side. Okay. Because he said, Jeffrey, he said, want... I saw, I saw, I saw five thousand. I saw five thousand black men. I chose you. <laughs> <laughs> no, That's he said, a lot. no, he said, I saw five thousand Negroes. I chose you. <laughs> okay, and then he called me George. up like Sunday before we started previews. I think, and I think oh, for gosh. some reason we were going to start. A, we we're going to do a preview on Monday, if I'm not mistaken. He called me up Sunday before we were coming into rehearsal. And he said, Jeffrey, it's not working. And I it's said, it's not working. I said, I know, George. I have one more day. Um, but, uh, Whoa. yeah, he's like, you, you know, you've got, you know, he said, I said, well, I said, well, you know, I'm, t- you know, at some point I said, you know, I, I don't think it was that point. I think it was earlier. I said, I'm just trying to find my way through. I'm trying to, you know, get comfortable in this role. Well, and he said, yeah. and George said the most on point thing. He said, Jeffrey, I don't want your comfort. I want your talent. Ooh. Uh-huh. Yeah. So. I don't want your comfort as in your being in your comfort zone as an yeah, actor. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's not about that. It's about telling this story. If anything, story. it's about the opposite. It's exactly, kind of exactly. What you said earlier about um, doing what scares you, or, or uh, acting scared you. Yeah. And it was doing it that kind of crosses you over the threshold into... Yeah, well, that's why I hadn't done it, because I was afraid. I, this, I, I know I, I would have these kind of nightmares about getting yeah. being on stage. and Sure. And my mouth not working. I've had things. those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. <laughs> yeah, so... Yeah. And it just felt so kind of, you know exposed you know and felt so kind of like uh so what made you do it i couldn't not do it anymore Amazing. you know and and then also there was a friend of mine in college uh who took this acting class and he, he said come see my you know we, we're gonna do we're gonna put on a production uh-huh. at the end of the year and at the end of the year came he said come see the performance and i said okay man okay so i guess so i you know that was sophomore year so i went mm-hmm. in i went went in and i saw the Saw what my buddy did, and I said to myself, uh, "I can do that at least." <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep, I know that yeah, feeling. Yeah. yeah, so the next year, I, go, I signed oh. up for the. <laughs> yeah. The next year, there it was. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Um, oh. We should talk about Westworld. Yeah. Uh, does that? Does this series count as something that scares you? Does this? What kind of challenges does this role present? Oh, you know, I would think there would be some really interesting challenges for you. Yeah, you know, I guess there's an initial for me, initial inklings of anxiety. You know, I don't get, I'm don't, I'm, I'm never uh, afraid, but I do get anxious still mm-hmm. at some point during you know uh, any job, and up till very recently, and not including Westworld. Um, or rather, including Westworld, hmm. um, I've thought that I was going to get fired at some point early on in every job that I've had. You're scarred from the Angels in America thing. No, uh, I think even prior to that, you know, it was even predated <laughs> that, you know. No, it was just like I don't know because I never know. I never know what I'm going to the hell I'm going to do, you yeah. know, and I got to figure it out, and you know, nobody knows, and it's just this thing. Mm. And, but again, maybe it, maybe it, you know, helps like light a fire. You know, yeah. but uh, but uh, well, it's interesting you say that because you want to make choices and as an actor early in a TV show. Yeah. But sometimes if you make a choice and then the writing contradicts that choice later in your mind, you then have to adjust. And I think in your case, you didn't know the big twist about your character when you filmed the pilot. Is that correct? Right. 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 No, you know, you can't you can't make a choice. Every choice that you make has to fit within the confines of the writing, you know? Yeah, for sure. So, you know, if you make, you know, if you made a choice that doesn't, then you made a wrong choice, you know. Um, And is that what you get anxious about? No, I just get anxious about, you know, I was like, oh, man, I don't don't even know. It's all like, you know, the 
imaginary, you know, uh, I don't know. Temporary it, loss it, of faith it's just, in yourself. Right? Yeah, yeah. It's just like you just, and it, I mean, it's not lasting, but at some point yeah. it's like, okay, here it comes. Yeah. Uh, uh, you can recognize it when it comes out. Yeah, but uh, but it, you know it's all it's all made up. You know, yeah. you know kind of self serving. And that's thing, normal. Actors, it's normal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, totally normal, totally normal. Yeah. But with Westworld, I think you know the anxiety came. I think there were two two kind of points of anxiety early on. One was also exciting. Was that okay? Here we go. We've got this huge scale, this huge production. Mm. It's going to come with huge expectations. Sure. We've got this film that came before this, you know. Yeah. That's a cult classic and nothing else. Right. Really to serve as source material. But we're going to dig it out of the dirt and we're going to, you know, try to create this thing, you know, and we're trying to tell these, in, you know. Yeah. Do something compelling. <clears throat> and, and, and. Unlike Boardwalk Empire mm-hmm. or The Hunger Games, where there had been work done prior to my showing up, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, the first day of filming of Westworld, yeah. of the pilot, was was Anthony Hopkins and myself. And so, okay, we're going to build this thing out of nothing. And that was, yeah. that was like, there was a little, I was like, okay. But actually, but at the same time, that's part of the reason that I was drawn to it. Because like, okay, let's take that risk, you know, and, right. and, and see if we can, if we can. I love that building from the, yeah. from scratch, yeah. basically. Yeah. And the second uh, point of anxiety was, yeah. was that I was going to be working with Anthony Hopkins. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it wasn't oh, that... I'd never worked with before. I'd never worked with before, never met him before, okay. and so the concern was 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 really about off-camera, you know? Oh. Well, would we... Are we going to get Are we gonna get on, you know? Or, yeah. Or, you know, that I'd was... I'd be nervous about that, yeah. You know, and 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 the first day, one, we, we worked together very, you know, very well. Uh-huh. And then we... And we, and we gradually... Uh, you know, and he's a wonderful man. He shows up at six o'clock in the morning on set by seven, and there's like fire coming out of his, <laughs> out of wow. coming out of him. You know, at that, at that time, he's just like he's just like revved up and ready to go first thing in the morning. It's cool. fantastic, but he's wonderfully open, jovial. Uh, you know, just you know, just bright, uh, bright of mind, bright of eyes. You know, but and we 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 you know we ended up spending most of our time over the mm-hmm. course of two years because it took us that long you know right. uh right. you know off off stage talking about you know he'd tell great stories about you know the days of you know the early you know days of his career with olivier and yeah great he tells some incredible stories about because he's really that you know that bridge and between that world of kind of traditional you know or the, uh, english theater yeah. olivier to you know up to you know, contemporary American cinema. So, totally, a lot of, a lot of, lot of, must have so many, yeah, crazy stories about Shakespeare. Yeah, a lot of casts of characters he's been a part of, right. and uh, and so we talk about that, and we talk about history, and and talk about politics. You know, right, a lot, and so it was great. <laughs> but you great, didn't have any of that time. filming the pilot, which, as you mentioned, was filmed twenty fourteen, very very long ago. Yeah, yeah, didn't have that rapport with him. Uh, n- yeah, it was about ca- you know no, we didn't no. have that we didn't have that that you know so we built so that trust mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. and that relationship was built over time and then so by the mm. time it came for us to really kind of get into it yeah you know toward the end of the end of the season you know um I you know there was a there was a there was a there was a, a, a nice partnership there for sure and I feel like Westworld is the kind of show it's just such a compelling show like the. It's all about nano expressions. It's all about mm. like tiny little interactions between people. Yeah. And I think maybe especially for those two characters mm. because, and this is probably when we get into spoiler territory of like, mm. listeners, if you haven't watched Westworld, first of all, definitely watch season one of Westworld. Yeah. <laughs> please. That. But um, it's a big old twist with Jeffrey Wright's character. <laughs> and um, it does shift the dynamic between him and Anthony Hop- and Anthony Hopkins. Mm. Um Tell me more. This is the first time I'm hearing any of this. <laughs> There's a scene where it turns out that Anthony Hopkins can control Bernard. Mm. Um, what is Anthony Hopkins' character's name? Dr. Ford. Dr. Ford, right. So Ford, it transpires, can control Bernard, and that is because Bernard is, in fact, a robot. See, I haven't gotten to that episode yet. <laughs> See there? I accidentally ah. revealed it. <laughs> what it's- was your... I, you've probably 
told this story before, but what was your reaction? Like, how did they tell you that this was the case for your character? And uh, what did that change? Yeah, we came back in to um, film the, the, you know, the second episode, and we'd been off for maybe five months. We, it was a little bit longer um, mm-hmm. hiatus than we had planned after the pilot. Mm-hmm, we came mm-hmm. back, and Lisa Joy, who's Jonah Nolan's uh, co-lead uh, mm-hmm. writer and wife, yeah. they're incredible, incredible totally. people. I just don't, and they, 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 they write, you know, Westworld together. They lead the show. They have children. Yeah. First season, another child, or one child, oh, the first wow. season, another child, the second season. I mean, they're just unbelievably Crazy. creative wow. people and like ridiculously energetic and and just like the most delicious. Um, you know, if you have to have bosses, have bosses like those those guys. Cool. They're wonderful. But so Lisa pulls me in. She says, uh, and she's you know she went to Harvard Law. Uh, yeah, yeah. She left Harvard Law. She was working in the in the uh, DA's office in here in LA, and with you know, I think McKinsey. Right. I mean, she went to calculus camp. She says it's right. a kid. Yeah. She's incredibly bright, incredibly articulate. Uh-huh. But it took. She stumbled she around. She's tell like, you. Um, okay, Jeffrey, how do I? T- uh, um, <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, Bernard's very complicated. Um, okay. Well, uh, uh, okay. All right. Here it is. Yeah. You're not real. You're not You're real. A host. Oh. And I was like, what? Oh, wow. And, uh, you know, it just my uh, my head went, my, you know, my, my jaw, <laughs> like, on the, that, yeah. was my, that was my jaw <laughs> hitting the floor. Um, and, uh, as an actor, is that like the dream? Is it the dream twist? Well, or, it, it, I, you know, I don't, you know, it was a great one. Uh, it's hard to it's hard to dream about this show because hmm. they are so far ahead of the game, you know. Ah. And, and so you can't. I, so okay. I, so for me, I just knew it then meant that there was Bernard was leading us through ah. the discovery of these various worlds and these various holes in the rabbit warren yeah inner uh, and outer worlds right yeah. but he's also exactly he's also going going on a journey of discovery for himself right. and the audience wasn't fully a, about himself and the audience wasn't fully aware of that but i was and so mm. yeah that was but i didn't know i knew as well that he was you know he was uh you know the template for him was the co-creator of the park right um whose name at the who you know was i didn't know was arnold uh mm-hmm. until we until until it became revealed at some point at some point we talked about that but i knew you know i knew the structure of that right of his, of bernard's relationship to him and all of this and, and then the history a bit of the history because I, I had to otherwise i wouldn't have known what the, heck, exactly. what the heck i was doing it was just all you know it, it was necessary for me to know certain of these things because it did inform it inf- less so my choices but more so my understanding of what i was doing you know? Interesting. Yeah, it wasn't that. Okay, now I'm going to play a and robot. And now I use my I'm eyes play, differently, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But but there were but there were certain, for example, with Bernard, there were moments in the in the script where there were little clues dropped to the audience. Yes. And sure. so we and so I wouldn't. It would just kind of recognize that this is a this is a this mm. is a this is a day glow uh, <laughs> breadcrumb mm-hmm. that will become you know more mm. fluorescent. Yeah. you know a bit later and stuff and so we, yeah there so you're not going to oversell that moment again. no 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 but but <laughs> you just but you do you know kind of put it in in a little bit yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah yeah and then you get to act scenes where you have to freeze all motor functions yeah. and <laughs> yeah slip in and out of understanding that you are a host yeah. a little bit yeah you also get to die yeah just Twice, several huge even. yeah yeah huge just twists and turns for well, well yeah it's, and, and, and that was why I didn't really fully understand the implications of what it meant you know mm. that he was a host early on but it became more par- apparent to me you know further and even now what that means because what I what I started to really um, really dig was that you know as we tried to mimic human behavior through these yeah. hosts, we were having to make these considerations about what human is and what consciousness is and what emotions are, where they come from, you know, your thoughts, how they're generated, all of these things that make up self, you know, we would have to kind of play with For as, sure. it's so you know, so, deep. But, but that's what we do as actors, you know? Absolutely. So, you know, basically actors fact, are Tandy hosts, Newton, I guess. Or, uh, Tandy yeah. Newton on this podcast said the same thing that, yeah. or she, I think she actually said that being a, being a host on that show means 
not that you're less human, but that you're more, yeah, you're more intensely human. Well, well, yeah, to to some extent, because you know you're 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 building a human, yeah, that through yeah. your own your own th- being. Um, but I think you know what's what's fascinating too is that uh, there's a, an opportunity to take it even further, you know, beyond like kind of emotion, beyond thought, behavior, and things like that, into uh, more kind of pro- programmatic. Uh, I, ideas like kind of like you know so you know uh, this agreement that we have about time yes uh, together you know that's <laughs> really a you know it's a it's an invention it's a human construct uh-huh. but we all make an agreement about it so I said I would be here yeah. you know at a certain times so yeah. I was I well, do that I do that on the case. I was I, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, occasionally I get that right uh-huh. um, but you know there are certain agreements that we have we have uh, an agreement with ourselves about material things that if I touch that wooden door that uh-huh. it will feel a certain way right. but these again are constructs right wow. so if right so yes. you know so if you're like building a robot you're in, you're like inputting that stimulus into it you're programming it to recognize that these certain sensations relate to these experiences uh-huh. right so i think one of the fun things is is to take, you know, is, you know, maybe exploring even further the idea of, of humanness, in, you know, into more granular kind of even, I don't know if you call, you know, metaphysical to the physical metaphysical. Sure. So, so like, for example, Jonah turned me on to, uh, you know, some uh, Philip Dick short stories, uh-huh. you know, like, uh, you know, Philip Dick who wrote, you know, the books that Minority Report based on and Blade Runner. And mm. so these short stories, one particularly called The Electric Ant, which mm-hmm. is really great. Short so it's like I think it's like I don't know like twenty it's like twenty thirty pages but um, but deals with the character who 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 discovers that he's not what he thought he was and uh-huh. and it's it, you know and it gives you room to play as Dick did and you know right. sort of stuff that we do you get to play with these kind of you know theological questions and existential questions and philosophical totally. questions because you know basically we all are kind of constructs in some form or another you right. know? so I, I think that's one of the tricks that that made made the show kind of compelling because we recognize that yeah we're on our loops too and you know we're trying to break out of them or not and we're you yeah. know going through you know uh, kind of uh, you know the hosts are really metaphors for you know for they they are they're metaphors for humans so right and that's the thing about sci-fi like i i'm realizing that sci-fi and actors they are asking the same questions. Yeah. Like, there's a reason that that those are two very compatible yeah. worlds. Yeah, that you are plumbing the depths of humanity and philosophy. Yeah, and so are those who are inventing alternate histories yeah. or futures that yeah. are also metaphors, or that are accidentally metaphors, yeah. or that are metaphors to some people, not others. And like, yeah, it's mythology. I mean, the earliest sci-fi, right, right is like the Bible, right? And, totally. You know, or or. or or, you know, Greek mythology, you know, here he comes flying through, you know, the sky with, you know, wings on his, on his heels and, you know, the, you know, Zeus, you know, lightning bolts. And I mean, it's all yeah. like, you know, you know, Hercules and Sisyphus. And I mean, it's, yeah. it's all, these are, you know, they're greater than, you know, so it's yeah. all. And just and because it, it's fanciful and greater than doesn't mean that it's not, doesn't say something fundamental about the human condition. Yeah. It provides a foil uh, um, against which to view humanity, right? Yeah, so that's cool. the, yeah, I mean, that's, it's great. I don't know, you know, how that worked out in the math, but, you know, it does work yeah. in that way that it allows us to, you know, these things that are incredibly imaginative and fan, fan you know, uh, uh, fantastical and mm-hmm. sci fi or mythological or really the farther we get away from, yeah. you know, re, from realism, the closer we get to, uh, you know, to um, a window through which we can view humanity. It's, yeah. I don't know. And it's all about those windows. That's what you're trying to find as an actor. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Sure. Why not? And not make a fool of yourself. And not make a <laughs> fool of yourself. Yeah. Yeah. A number one. Well, I'm short circuiting. That was so that was so deep. That was crazy. Oh boy. Um I want to ask about we got to get to some acting advice stuff too, but first I want to ask about listening mm-hmm. as a skill. What would you say? Listening. I feel that was like a joke. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I'm not. I <laughs> Um is it a skill, first of all, and is it a skill that you can learn or get better at? And like, how central is it? I feel like it's something that you are very good at. What is that? Particular. No, I couldn't do that twice. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, I think it's. It may be. I may enjoy listening. Um, you know, in acting mm. more so than 
than talking. Than, uh, yeah. Yeah. Doing the reacting more than yeah. the acting. Yeah. Yeah. Because I don't know why. Because it's there's a subtlety uh-huh. to it. <clears throat> I mean, and if you're listening to someone like Anthony Hopkins, that seems fairly self-explanatory as to why that's well, yeah, compelling. Um, but but that's not, but, but 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 of course, when you're when you're speaking, you're listening as well, you know. So sure. uh, because in in the best ways, you know, you're you're blending for performances, you know. So there's a synthesis of the performance that comes because. You know, there was a note that was changed mm. in the delivery, and so your note, you know, in order to make sense, you know, fluctuates, or you just, you know, you come together, and it's, yeah, it's just, you know, you, 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 you gotta, you gotta have your, an, you know, your an, antennae up, you know, yeah. yeah, it's, yeah, makes it much more, gives you more to work with, you know, makes sure. it easier, you know, otherwise yeah. you're, otherwise you're trying to generate it all yourself, which really is not that well, and interesting. Well, sometimes you have to generate it all yourself, like. How do monologues work? <laughs> yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, in 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 that situation, um, like in a Shakespearean soliloquy, all of the revelations and all of the he almost writes it out for you so that you can listen to yourself. Yeah, you have to listen to yourself because yeah, with Shakespeare <clears throat> or really with any of it, mm-hmm. I mean, it's there's a music to it, mm-hmm. you know, um, and that's not to say you're singing words but there's yeah. muse there's a there's a music and a poetry and mm. a rhythm and a timing not just to the sounds but to the emotions and the ideas and the imagery you know yeah so that's you know so yeah you're always kind of crafting it to say you know because you're not sure. just playing any music you know yeah that's you're why pleased. it, it takes practice what's that it yeah takes practice to get all yeah. those nuances yeah and... you know miles davis played his horn you know and charlie parker and those guys played you know they rehearsed more than they played you know yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. excellent yeah um what is your number one piece of uh early career acting advice don't do it <laughs> so that weeds out those who will listen to that <laughs> yeah uh, we'll wait advice. for them to stop listening yeah and then... okay now those who stayed <laughs> Uh, who are still listening? Then um, my f- advice uh, is be, I've, my v- advice is pretty simple. But I'll give like two pieces of advice. When people ask me, you know, what do I do? How do I? And people come up to me, how do you know? Hey, man, I want to go. Or how am I going to say? Mm-hmm. Do a play. Okay. You know. Yeah. And I guess you know, selfishly, it worked for me. I did a well, play, and one thing led to another after that. But start. But that's how it goes. Start with that. Everybody, so everybody wants to be, you know. Um, Everybody wants to be known, you know, we all want to be, sure. whether it's on YouTube or on Instagram, we all want to be seen, but, you know, and we want to be in films. I think a lot of actors are drawn to first, or a lot of people who aspire to be actors, maybe are drawn Inspired to some of the, by. some of the things on the outside, yeah. as opposed to what it, what's at its core and what, what's at its core is yeah. knowing what the hell you're doing and doing it, you know, trying to do it well. And mm-hmm. so... I still think the theater is the best place to learn how to yeah. do this stuff, you know? And, you know, if you look at, you know, I don't know, man, the actors that I always, uh, that I was, you know, was Brando. Brando was, you know, mm-hmm. was, you know, was on the, on the, the stage theater. and Dustin Hoffman and, mm-hmm. you know, De Niro, you know, was on the stage, you know, uh, they, you know, they were, they were all on the stage, you know, um, Poitier, you know, who's like you know, one of the yeah. first role, first like kind of single shots that I had was opposite uh, Sidney Poitier. You know, he was. They, yeah. they were all, you know. So anyway, so yeah, and that still holds true. So I would say do a play, Excellent. get in, find a place to start to, and, and and you get to control it too. You get to, you know, nobody's going to yell cut. Nobody's going to come on stage, and you know, kind of that. You get to, you know, have to you, you're tasked with controlling the time and controlling the relationship to the sure. audience and. You know that's invaluable and so uh the other advice um i would give to young actors particularly you know uh-huh. is to learn everything you can about those things outside of the world of you know film and theater the real you know, world yeah yeah and to study you know for those who are studying you know study everything else everything <laughs> study everything it all else because you have, into it because because yeah. because it's you know uh it's about context you know when you're telling stories mm-hmm. you're not telling stories about telling stories you might but you're sure. you know largely telling but stories that exist within of, exactly right exactly so it just helps you know the other you know it also helps when you're doing these things to you know 
to know what the hell you're talking about. That's yeah. always a useful thing. You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent advice. Thank you so much well, cool. for joining us. This is great. Um, I think we got to wrap up. Oh, boy. But thank you. All righty. Thank you, man. All right. Good to meet you. There's a reason Jeffrey Wright is acting royalty, not just to me. I mean, as that interview made clear. Wasn't that amazing? Yeah, absolutely. And he's been involved in some huge projects, and you can see yeah. why. He's a great yeah. guy. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we had to say goodbye to him and send him on his way because uh, he's in the middle of filming, or I believe it was rehearsing, Westworld Season 2. And I'm we're so excited for, for yeah. what is going to happen on this crazy show. Yeah, both him and Tandy Newton seemed super excited mm-hmm. to get back in the saddle. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I'm so excited for, for more from that crazy, weird drama in the Old West and the far future. We've got a bit of a wait, unfortunately. Yes, Spring 2018, but it's going to be it's worth true. it, I'm sure of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, should we roll credits? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Be sure to like, rate, and subscribe for more interviews from the front lines of the 2017 Emmy race. In the Envelope, an awards podcast is recorded at Lotus Productions and Hyperbolic Audio in New York City and Soundbox LA in Los Angeles. Thank you, as always, to producer, editor, and all-around podcast wizard, Jamie Muffet. You can follow him at Jamie Music NYC on Twitter. You can follow me, Jack Smart, on Twitter at Jack Smart Writes. Thank you, as always, to the team at Backstage, the most trusted name in casting. That's Peter Rappaport, Ryan Remstad, Jesse Balashek, Francis Ramos, Mark Stinson, Rowan al and especially, definitely, without a doubt, Casey Howe. For more awards and industry coverage, head over to Backstage.com. Thanks for listening. Tune in next time for another glimpse in the envelope. <laughs>